Name a more iconic duo than Change and Esports. I'll wait. Additions and tweaks are made to esports titles all the time, with some seeing changes nearly every week. New characters, items, levels, they're all added to the game to make it more interesting for both casual players and hardcore fans. But one change made to CSGO, outside of the game itself, changed the way organizations structured their rosters and put an emphasis on players who could lead their teams from the front lines. In August of 2016, Valve dropped a bombshell of a ruling on the CSGO community, limiting the way coaches could talk to their players in-game. Quote, during a match, the coach may only communicate with the players during warm-up, halftime, or during one of four 30-second timeouts that the coach or players can call. Now, that might not sound so bad out of context, but there's something you have to understand. Before the ruling, coaches were totally unrestricted in how they could talk to their players, and that was the standard for years prior, even before Global Offensive. Back in the days of 1.6 and Source, coaches had free reign to talk to and direct their players whenever they wanted, but they were limited to standing behind them and gleaning whatever information they could from watching their screens. But CSGO brought a new innovation to the game, a spectator mode with special coaching features that allowed coaches to spectate their players from inside the game, provided they were given their own dedicated PC at an event. This feature allowed coaches to see and hear everything their players saw and heard, and it gave them a much clearer picture of what was going on in the game. Spectator mode elevated coaches' abilities to make a strategic call, and as the feature became more ubiquitous, a simple question began to emerge. Why bother with a bottom-fragging in-game leader when you could just pick up another aim star and get your coach to make all the calls? This mindset played a role in how organizations built their rosters from around 2015 to 2016. Gob B, for example, was removed from Mao Sports and replaced by Speedy. Zeus was kicked from Nadas Vincere and replaced by Simple. Slemmy exited Cloud9 with Automatic taking his place. And Ninjas in Pajamas were being transformed under the leadership of Coach Threat. And even the entire concept for the old G2 Super Team roster, the one that was later sold to FaZe Clan, was birthed from this brawn over brains mentality. In the meantime, CSGO was getting bigger, and like in any growing game, organizations started building up support staff to get an edge on the competition. Coaches, analysts, trainers, nutritionists, you get the idea. They provide relief to the players, and then the player's level of play improves. Or so the theory goes. It's just like in any traditional sport, you got coaches and you got more support staff and you got more people helping you do your job, right? So like in ice hockey, you know, you got physical trainers and you know, offensive coaches, defensive coaches, and assistant coaches. In Counter-Strike, I thought part of what was going to be cool about having coaches and stuff is that a couple of things happen when you have a coach. One, it makes it so the players playing can focus more on their game. So yeah, you make it so the, the, there's more skilled players in the game, right? And more people that like strategy and have a mind for strategy can focus only on that and don't have to play at the same time. So those are the benefits. Despite that, Valve clearly felt like the direction of competitive CSGO was straying too far from what they had intended for the game. For instance, Valve never allowed coaches to have their own dedicated spectating PCs during majors, even though it was Valve who introduced those features in the first place. The way that I see it is that Valve have already made it perfectly clear to the players that they don't want the sixth man to be the in-game leader, right? They don't want the coach to be that involved in the game. And they made this months ago, right? They, they, they basically made it clear. They even made it so that TO, you know, tournament organizers, TOs, you know, not give PCs, for example, to the coach, you know, that the coach should just be standing there behind the players, you know, if anything, you know, that they shouldn't have their own PC to be able to look in game, etc. cetera. Um, you know, they've made it pretty clear, it seems now for quite some time, that the teams shouldn't have that in-game leader be the sixth man. The company's philosophy on coaching was further elaborated on after the Columbus Major, when former Team Liquid coach GB James met with Valve developers to pick their brains about the future of the CSGO competitive scene. Relating his meeting with the Valve devs in a twit longer, he said the coach spec option in-game took off more than they originally intended. They want to protect the integrity of the 5v5 team experience for the lower levels who do not have coaches. Essentially, they want viewers at home who play the game to be watching the same game that they play at home. Three months later, Valve finalized their decision and laid down the law. During a match, the coach may only communicate with the players during warm-up, during halftime, or during one of four 30-second timeouts that the coach or player can call. Obviously, third-party events can use whatever rules they want, but if you want to align your events with ours, then we recommend using this coaching rule. Valve's intentions were made clear, and the CS community was not happy. 
happy about it. At the heart of Valve's argument was a desire to preserve the 5v5 team format of CSGO that fans were getting at home. Valve wanted fans to feel like the only thing that was separating them from the pros was skill, not outside influences like a six man who oversaw every play. Needless to say, the coaches themselves took issue with this new rule as well. But despite protests coming from all sides of the CS community, Valve doubled down, making a public announcement reaffirming their new rule set and rebutting any allegations that they didn't communicate their intentions effectively with the competitive community. Valve, in their eyes, they've seen, they've given the players time to make adjustments. The players haven't made adjustments, or not really. They've kind of kept doing what they wanted. And so Valve have finally decided, right, if you're not going to make the adjustments, we're going to force you to make the adjustments. And there we go. And so we'll see where we go from there. It's important to note that technically, Valve's rules only affected the majors and the minors, and unaffiliated tournament organizers could do whatever the hell they wanted. But since the majors are the bedrock that the entire CSGO competitive scene is built on, the rules still had an effect on how teams built their rosters. All of a sudden, some of those teams that dropped their IGLs and let their coaches take the reins were in serious trouble. But despite disruption from Valve's new rules, other affected teams were still able to find success. Liquid and Na'Vi, for example, both teams with high-profile coaches in Starix and Peacemaker, were both in attendance for the first tournament to use a new rule set, ESL1 New York 2016. While both had poor results in the lead-up, they defied expectations, advancing past the Swiss group stage with Na'Vi going undefeated. The CIS squad went on to beat Liquid in the semis and won the entire event. Nearly gets caught toward the sandwich's pass, and he will go down eventually on the repeat, but not before Snacks gets one. Flame, he's on it, you called it. They're on the defuse. It's a championship inside smoke. Navi! But not every team weathered the storm. Ninjas in Pajamas, a legendary name in Counter-Strike, failed to qualify for the first post-coaching band major in Atlanta. In many ways, Valve's new rules diminished the roles of coaches to a point where it seems like they're even less essential than they were in 1.6 and Source. But while some in the community theorized that coaches were at risk of losing their jobs, they had overlooked IGLs, who were already out of work or close to it prior to the coaching change. With the advent of coach spectating, in-game leaders were being pushed out of top teams and replaced by more mechanically skilled players. But Valve's coaching ban ensured the necessity of in-game leaders on all top-level teams, and their stock bounced right back. Glaive was one such IGL that stepped up after the rule change, leading Astralis to a major victory in Atlanta, the first major for the Danish team. Even Kerrigan, the leader who has kicked off of Astralis, found his redemption when he took over as FaZe Clan's IGL. And let's not forget Zeus, who, after being left behind by Na'Vi, went on to win the Krakow Major with Gambit Esports. While Valve's sudden and drastic change may have ushered in a dark age for coaches, it was a huge shot in the arm for that rare breed of player who can call the strats and frag with the rest of the team. A lot can be said about how Valve handled the coaching rule, from both sides of the issue. And it's tempting to imagine a world where the coaching ban never took effect. Would Pro CS be more dynamic, more strategic, more exciting if it were just five fraggers on a team with an omnipotent coach calling all the strats? Maybe. But it's been nearly two years since the ban was implemented, and it doesn't seem like the rule is changing anytime soon. When it comes to Valve's games, what they say goes. Thanks for watching. If you want more great content just like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button.